the welcome to the November fourth Long Range Planning Committee meeting. Uh, we we're in the public safety building this morning. Uh, almost full attendance, so I'm sure we're okay in terms of quorum. First item on the agenda is to review the minutes of October seventh. Anybody have any comments? I'll move to approve. Second. All in favor? <clears throat> All right. Looks like unanimous. Order. Review of conflict of interest requirements and committee member disclosure opportunity. Sure. Uh, I just included this. This is a memo from our town attorney, and I thought it was just good. We usually provide this to all the committees and boards, and so I included it in your packet. And essentially, if there's a conflict or any potential conflict, uh, just notify the committee or the board, and then you all can vote on it if you decide that that person needs to recuse themselves. So I just, this is just some, some light reading for you, uh, some information moving forward, so we don't have any issues. But I think everything uh, should be good in the future. Should you just make a note to do this maybe annually? Certainly. Yeah. We'll definitely sure. do that. And I think actually, uh, if I can add, next month we will be getting uh, the appointments committee goes through. So we'll have some new uh, perhaps members, uh, liaisons. And so we might do it again in, yeah, or in January or, with that yeah. new group. So just, you might yeah. see this again, but just for some information, because I want to go through each of those. The committees that touch the long range of their comprehensive plan to remind them what all this group is doled out. And so I think you probably will see it again. So I think that's a great idea. Um, I need to practice this on the agenda because I'm pretty sure that we froze the last meeting. And I, I just wanted to, I mean, in my case, things are a little different or beyond this in the sense that. I could potentially have a client, have a client who is pursuing a zoning change, for example, and that comes to the this committee for review and comment. It is my practice, although I fell down a little bit at the last meeting, I would say at the outset of that item, look, I represent the Smith Company, and they're the ones that are putting forward this amendment. So I'll, you know, I'm not going to participate in the discussion. I'm not going to offer any comments. I'm just going to sit here and listen. That one's pretty easy. I was thinking about this last night, but one that I think gets a little trickier for me as, a, as an attorney, there could be a, a zone-wide, a town-wide change to something. And I may not have a client specifically involved in that, but it could be that the outcome of that item might benefit or not benefit one or more clients of my firm. It's impossible for me to go through our client list and say, you know, do we have any clients with property in Scarborough? I, I don't do that. I When I was on the planning board, whenever I could chair the planning board, when I'd get the agenda, I'd run it by the, the firm and say, here are the things that are before the board next Monday. Is anybody involved? And now we actually, every day we get a list of new clients to all the attorneys. And at the end of it, it says, Shanae is a member of the Long Range Planning Committee. So, so, so people are at least alerted to get back to me and say, yeah, I represent Smith Company that's interested in the matter. So that one's a little trickier. And, and I don't really know how to deal with it other than. I don't know. I'd offer though that, that with those sort of blanket sort of things happen, all of us probably are in some way materially impacted, and therefore have a have a, an interest. In, in fact, we're on this committee because we are um, uh, invested in Scarborough in, in that way. So, um, other than those really point specific ones, which are property specific, or we're changing, or we're establishing a new zone for, for whatever, I think I think we feel comfortable. I certainly feel comfortable with you, that you're just representing yourself and you're representing your interests as a town member rather than anything else. So, I'm good with that. And I'm biased. You. Yeah. I respectfully disagree and believe that it may or may not put some of your clients in an advantageous position. And um, 
I, I would just like us to, to think about that long and hard um, as far as maybe uh, understanding your role moving forward. Um, maybe it's ex officio or some other type of non-voting sort of technical advisory type thing. And this is meant with the utmost due respect for all the work that you've done in the past and that you continue to do. But I uh, respectfully disagree that I think it does put your firm at a particular advantage to understanding the work that's what's happening. Thank you. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying, but are you saying that even if I'm not representing a party, if I have, if, if Drummond Woodson has property clients who own property in town and we're considering say a change to the... Respectfully, if you're saying it's impossible to call your client list, and your client's interests, then perhaps it's impossible to separate from the advantage that it would give to potential clients or potential businesses. I think that I heard something different, um, Robin, was that he could do that on a specific basis, but when we look at the town as a whole and, and look at the entirety of change within the town, um, uh, essentially everyone doing business in the town is affected, mm -hmm. including you and I. Yep. Um, and, and I can disclose that I have a home business and therefore work in town, um, but um, that doesn't preclude me from thinking about the town as a whole on this committee. And I would, and I think where you're going with that, unfortunately, would take us down a road where no attorney, whether it's from Drummond Winston or from Bernstein Shore or anyone, could ever serve as a voting member of this committee. And I think that's I, that's a bridge too far for me. Uh, I offer that there is something between all and nothing that we should think about okay. as far as a, an advisory position. That would be true for engineering firms. And, I mean, anybody who's technically involved. Or, yeah. Yeah, engineering companies, surveying companies may have clients who they represent. I mean, as a lawyer, it's a little bit. I mean, I have a, I can't, well, I can't be adver I can't advocate something adverse to my client's interests. Where I think it comes into play here is I mean, the, the general thing I think is impossible to be a, just I don't know. But let's say, well, for example, I represent the owner of the, the Cabela's property. Suppose they came forward and said, we want to uh, propose a change to the zone that that project is in, and it comes here for review and, and advice to the council. I would say to everybody, I represent the New England Expedition LLC. I should not, I can't, I don't have, and, then, and I- and that's I, clear I, cut. Yeah. That's clear yeah. cut, yeah. but um, <clears throat> I mean, we all own homes in Scarborough, I suppose if there were an, an amendment to some zoning ordinance issue that might affect us personally, that could flip us out probably. Let me ask a follow-up question if I may. Have you, I mean, I, I hesitate short of saying, Perhaps you have clients who are drawn to you and your 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 uh, expertise because you are so deeply embedded in the town of Scarborough and the inner workings. Has has that happened? I think attorneys, I mean clients, <clears throat> seek out attorneys for any number of reasons. One of which may be familiarity with a particular town's witnesses. I mean that's that happens all the time. I get clients who call me and say, "We understand your." Um, familiar with and involved with things in Scarborough, you know the players, you know the audience. Can you represent us in this development project? I mean, I had that a few weeks ago. Exactly. With a very so sure. Yeah. But uh, my point is, under those circumstances, I would just if something came before this committee relating to that client, I clearly have a I, I should not participate. It doesn't look good, it's not appropriate. I shouldn't even discuss it. I should just sit here <clears throat> and it's a public meeting, so I don't have to leave. Um, but I shouldn't do anything to sway the committee's decision or comments on whatever that item is. I'm just saying, on a broader perspective, I mean, I, I don't, I, it, it's a case by case thing. But I mean, if there was something before us, well, let's look ahead. This fleet vehicle parking thing, I don't have any clients that have any interest in that. And I haven't been contacted by any clients that say, oh, gee, they're looking to do this ordinance change in Scarborough. Can you help us 
oppose it or, or support it. I have not had that sort of thing. So I don't, I would not see any reason why I could offer general comments on that change, even though theoretically there may be a client drum of wood. So I mean, we have upwards to 15,000 clients. I, I can't check them all and I don't represent them all. I'm just one of many real estate. And I'm just one person expressing my opinion. And uh, based on my experience, uh, both on the planning board and the long range planning committee, that I, I think it's time that we look at these things. Well, I think I'm up for reappointment anyway. So if the council in its wisdom <laughs> chooses not to reappoint me for that, <laughs> that's really sure. reading I have to get up for. And, and I think we're good for this meeting right. for everyone to participate. And I'm actually really excited about this. But I, I, I <laughs> yeah. When Don and I had that discussion, I mean, I thought a lot about this. Stuff. And I think that's my practice, has been my practice when I was on the planning. And that will continue to be my practice. I just like to make one comment. You know, uh, Rick and I talked about efforts. I think that uh, trying to discuss the application of this, you know, the memo generally, very difficult. The memo is clear as mud, okay? We can only do it 18 ways from Sunday, and we're being. So I think that I kind of key on what Peter said as well and trying to take a general blanket prescription, you know, on a position and stuff like this is very difficult and it, it, it uh, may actually do more harm than good in terms of not expert resources to bear, but also not potentially being able to have the public's views brought forward as clearly as well. So I, you know, I think we just kind of wade into this point by point. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't have a view on what we should have, could have, would have done last time, but um, I thought this was a pretty helpful piece of information, and um, I think you probably have to be. Uh, I think so, and I think I'll just make a point uh, before every meeting. If we have specific things right. coming up, that we can just put it out there, and then it gets better, move on. I would say historically, Rick has always been very good you know, bringing it up ahead of time. So, I, I mean, personally, we all have interest in the town, but I also trust, trust his discretion when it comes to drawing the line between something that is uh, intricately involved with the firm and not. So, well, Mark, it'll be my practice. Yeah. Oh, right. I mean, there, there may be some cases where I can't say to the client, so sure. but I can certainly say, I have a client that has an interest in this. Issue. I've always known Rick to say that. I mean, I've been on the long range plan since 2013 um, with Rick. And Rick usually is, is, pipes right up. I have a client, <laughs> he usually says, you know, who, who may be interested in that. Um, I'm also, I mean, this is an interesting um, memo from, from Phil. Of course, I'd like more of a definition of pecuniary self-interest. I'm sure that goes on for 18 million pages in common law or and everything else. Um, and the only reason I ask that is if we have people who are on this, this board or any other board who, for example, are on leadership committees and PACs, political action committees, who are um, opposed to growth. Or, or something like that. I mean, does that cross the line too? And I would like to see that asked particularly of, of Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I would, my comments are not meant to be persecutorial toward Rickshnay whatsoever. I think we need to take a look at legal representation period. For example, Bernstein sure represents Bruce Barrett Brothers. So it's not just uh, one firm that I'm talking about. I think we need to really look long and hard. Thank you. Yeah, that's. I was just going to say that. Yeah, we don't want to trash out. <laughs> 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 I understand where I can work with skills. <laughs> but I'm sure there's other contractors who are doing development. And when I was on the planning board, Jay Chase was very 
adamant that I step down on anything associated with that. I was part of Friends of Scarborough Marsh. Oh, really? when there was anything engineering related, not only do I recuse myself, but I step away from the table and I sit in the audience so as not to uh, affect any personal or professional bias. Okay. Next item, uh, three continued discussion of comprehensive plan priorities, identify some different tasks. So we're back at the meeting, what we do. Back in the comp plan, and uh, I'm excited. I haven't zoning agenda item on here after it. We don't get to it, it's okay. Um, I have a hard stop at 9 30, and I know some of you all do as well. So, so if we don't get to agenda four, it's okay. We can do it. So, I just wanted to put these vision statements back up in front of us. Last time, very quickly, I went through uh, sort of next steps and to identify specific tasks. You're, you all did a very lengthy prioritization exercise, came up with the top six tasks. That you agree that we should tackle. And many of the actions, all, nearly all of that, review development regulations and zoning. And that means a lot of different things. And so I wanted to, with this board, this committee, dive into what those things mean and then really create sort of a meaningful work program so we can go through it uh, and tackle them in what I'm calling bite sized chunks. Uh, so these are the top six, top six tasks. Okay, uh, that this committee put into place. Uh, and what I've done for this PowerPoint is just sort of give some, I, I get tired of looking at words all the time. So just looking at some pictures, these pictures are just from no place in particular. So they're just to get as are visually stimulated at eight o'clock in the morning on a Friday, but to get to talk about things. So, so task one is encourage attractive mixed use centers in order to attract new businesses. It's very vague. It's a, it's a very lovely sentence, but what does that mean? And so, uh, you know, when I look at it as a planner, um, I look at the word attractive and I associate that with design standards and what the town has decided they want things to look like. Um, mixed use, obviously, that's zoning and density. And then attract oh. new businesses. Well, when you attract new businesses, you're trying to make sure that those new businesses can also attract their workers, right? So it's a it goes hand in hand. So these are some of the, the things that I um, thought about that would go into this task. So commercial design standards. We have some commercial design standards. They're a bit old, and I believe they're ripe for an updating, if you will. Uh, the planning board is in charge of putting those into place. Residential design standards, and not for your normal single family, perhaps, but for the two family, the duplexes, the condos, the, the mixed use. The landscaping standards, really looking at what we have in place now and what we really want to put into place in the future. Uh, use standards, housing options, setbacks, bulk standards. You see this, this task one, really involves quite a few opportunities to look at our ordinances and our regulations. And so um, that's what I've tried to do with this presentation. And then last time I gave you a handout. So if anybody did any homework, came up with new things to add to any of these, uh, just chime in. I mean for this PowerPoint presentation to be a little bit give and go and collaborative and discussion. If you see something um, that doesn't make sense to you or you have questions, please stop me. So this one, again, transit opportunities, complete streets, all of these things really roll into this idea. It doesn't mean that we have to do them all or tackle them all, but it's just some ideas that can go into, into this particular task. The one thing I'd add to this probably would be just general um, uh, uh, arterial capacity and, and that because, you know, they're, they're, I think part of when we say attractive, it also means attractive to the existing residents. And we already know that there's um you know, concerns about traffic in certain areas or certain intersections etc so i think there's some um incorporation of transportation planning or or or, or street design or street capacity yeah. certainly certain location of these things yeah. too yeah. and actual uh, application. we are under the transportation plan uh, 
We are just getting started though. Um, yep. so right. RIP, so that's different. Anything else on this particular? And we'll we can come back and it's a very fluid presentation. So we can come back. Mm -hmm. To Peter's comment though, I would say that uh, traffic is a piece in vision five. Mm -hmm. that has been assigned to the transportation committee mm -hmm. so while we can say you know we need to consider traffic when we start looking at complete streets and transit opportunities those link back to that vision five no it's exactly it's, it, it might be as we sort of <clears throat> sequence or integrate these into, into our thinking it's like we're we're um if we have a a subgroup or we have a task to to look at of number five we need to ask them to say <clears throat> hey, keep in mind that we're trying to also look to design, whether it's power centers or whether it's sort of nexus with it, nexus within the community, that would then become the centers of mixed use that we would like to sort of um, design attractively. That's one of the issues that we're, we're <laughs> circling around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, to that point too, there's a lot of, Over this, yeah. this board is the, sort of the umbrella, and then there's all these little pieces, and I'm, I'm and trying the, to make sure that when we have the new appointments next month and we start not over, but we get some new energy into all of these uh, groups that we go back in fresh with fresh eyes about the common plan. Making sure everything works together. Yeah, they're, they're all, they're not gonna, working in silos. They're going to be chicken and egg. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, task two is development should be located within the growth areas, encourage higher density and density. And so, the picture, the map is the comprehensive plan, the land use map. Um, and it very much looks like our zoning map. Um, just some ideas about the whole idea with this comp plan is that the growth areas are essentially along the Route 1 corridor. Um, there's some the downs and some other places, but we're really looking, other than a few little village centers, that's, that's really it. Um, and what I find when I look at this is your zoning map does a really good job of that. Uh, you're in good shape with that. But so growth areas are in place and the majority of your zoning is in place. Um, reviewing non-residential zoning categories may be for some residential opportunity. That's a possibility. We have some uh, zoning districts along Route 1 that don't allow residential and maybe they should allow for mixed use or some multifamily so that we keep it in those growth areas. So that's, I see that as an opportunity to address the zoning categories. And then density and height limitations, um, reviewing the existing GMO. I don't want to talk about that, um, <laughs> but I just I put it out here because I think that's part of the discussion, and that's that's happening in another group setting. Um, incentivize density where you want it. If this comp plan, and and I also want this committee to understand, I don't have anything at stake with this, right? So when I approach this as a planner, I look at what you all have got. <coughs> And then I try to get you there with ways. Um, none of this, I am not married to any of these topics or ideas. I'm just trying to give you some, some methods to get these tasks accomplished. Um, so if you say something that's like, oh, what were you thinking? By all means, it does not hurt my feelings. Um, and then complete streets again. So really focusing on where the growth happens, preserving the existing neighborhoods, preserving west of the turnpike, Really, that's what your zoning ordinance and your land use map says right now. Uh, so, and so these are some, uh, some opportunities to achieve those tasks. Task three: uh, review policies, ordinances, standards, including impact fees, GMO, and traffic reports to identify that there's no impediments to desired development. Again, uh, there's no really pictures for this other than you know money and permit fees right so um reviewing the existing gmo again that's going on affordable housing incentives mm -hmm. that really i feel like that is probably going to be a part of that gmo discussion maybe and that's where that really should lie and then density incentives impact fees and waivers um you know if you want affordable housing and a really easy incentive is we have a in, we have impact fees now and so an easy incentive is waive the impact fees for affordable housing. You know, it's a kind of a cleaner, clean way to do it other than location. Or, <laughs> or could you have them funded by a TIF incentive or something like that? Sure. Because 
Um, I'm noticing, uh, the first thing I noticed is that all, most of our designated growth areas are within environmentally sensitive areas that really require an increased performance standard mm -hmm. that developers are not willing to take on in, in this community. <laughs> um, and unless I'm just, we, yeah, so unless we require it and we're willing to put our money where our mouth is. So I think if we're going to waive <clears throat> any of these performance standards, impact fees, we have to be able to make sure that that type of sure. um, those performance standards are met and actually maybe even exceeded because when you're at the mouth of Scarborough Marsh or impaired rivers or even uh, healthy rivers and, and streams, um, the marsh is our brand and we have to protect it. Um, so this one also brings up opportunities to look at setbacks and bulk standards and then parking standards. Uh, we have uh, pretty, pretty standard parking standards, but if we want to encourage density and uh, consolidated growth, if you will, we might want to take a look at parking standards and how we address that. I, I would add to that um, permeable surface. Yes. Um, because as we continue to um, put hard surface on our land, <laughs> we're cutting down the aquifers and That's so on. Okay. So, and in Pervious cover, we have some pretty generous percentages that you can do right now. And so that is something that we should definitely. And looking at that for this task in conjunction with another task about conservation, it right. sort of makes sense. Right. Again, not looking at it in a silo, but looking at it as the big picture. Right. But if you look at impact fees and, and so on, I mean, that parking standards would include surface treatment. Yes. Well, and, the, and we could Design. require yeah. for it's low good. impact development standards. <clears throat> we're working on that for stormwater and those BFPs. And we're really, we're in a really fun place for me, <laughs> I think, and for our, you know, for Angela, our town engineer, I think there's a lot going on. It's just trying to get it all in place and, it all to make the story to make sense, right? So we're not we're telling the same uh, the same story. So task four is west of the main turnpike, uh, continue to be considered rural, retains the rural character and a pattern that protects natural resources and connects spaces. And so this is our zoning map, and it looks very much like our land use map. The zoning map really does a pretty good job, I think. Of putting these things into place. And so that's a positive to start from a new comp plan. You're not worrying about really rezoning a bunch of property and having to, to put things in place. This is already established. And I just put some pictures on it here, of some, some rural farming and some conservation design and some trail settings that may look a little different from in town. Just things to think about. But when you look at task four, uh, maintaining and reviewing the existing RF zoning. And so maintaining it in map, but maybe reviewing a few things that are um, permitted in it now, looking at the density and how it's, it allows development to occur. Um, the GMO, we have a limit right now that you can have 30 single family permits in the RF zone per year. Um, so does that get maintained? Does it get changed with the whole GMO discussion? I think that's part of that. And then some, yes. Could we increase that, but with caveats, meaning we can do, they require do whatever water. <laughs> yeah, and Just you know, and that, that, may, that may happen. I don't uh, know where they go. Yeah, to yeah. public sewer and water over there. That GMO no. discussion could go so many different ways um, exactly. that I really just don't know yet, you know, what, but definitely could or could not have more. I will say, uh, well, an extension of utilities is a is a dangerous it can yeah. be a dangerous positive, right? Because once you get it, well, people will work. people will follow. Development will follow. Uh, I know where I lived in Texas. My as a planner, I always wanted to live away from towns in the county with no public water or sewer. <laughs> it's I'm sort of protected, and I kind of can see what's going to happen. And on the flip side of that, um, you know, once once someone comes in and extends that sewer that I know that development will occur. And, and that's the tricky, making sure that GMO is there protecting, making sure all the other things 
that protect it for what we want are still in place. It's like you don't, the chicken and the egg is definitely in that situation. That's just my, my experience. With all due respect, they're already going there. They're just <laughs> going to the Gorham town line. Right. That had to impose a, a housing moratorium because they were so overloaded because mm -hmm. you couldn't do it in Scarborough. Right. So um, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and I'm the only one sitting here, I believe, lives west of the turnpike. Right. So, <laughs> and I we don't need a can of worms. But can you use just in two minutes? To the where point? are we with the GMO process? I mean, we just we got it. Um, okay. Yeah, there is a deadline for April 2023 to have a revised GMO. Um, John Anderson and Nick McGee are heading up the little subgroup and then they're actually going to do um, next next Wednesday is the town council special town council meeting and they're going to get some council input in that so it's very beginning um, yeah so I, I don't know it could go it could be very I, I think the idea is to keep it very simple and keep it um, easily understood and implemented but yeah it can it's a tricky tricky subject <laughs> um but again, going with that, so if you get water and sewer, rural design standards and performance standards, you know, making sure that, okay, great, we have services out there, but you still have to develop this way. And being really strong in those requirements from a town perspective. Performance standards, setback bolt standards, conservation requirements, all of those things can go hand in hand with this west of the turnpike development. So those are some um, topics that I see uh, could really affect this task. So five is protect healthy watersheds by directing growth to the current growth areas. Start to see a real theme here. Everything happens over here in this area. Everything doesn't happen over here. So this is our watershed map. Uh, just really putting some things into place that some other communities have. Be more specific. We, you know, the planning board, they get tasked with protecting wetlands with, you know, and I don't want to speak for you, Rachel, but it seems like a lot of it's like, we really want you to do this. Right. When the ordinance could say, you shall do this. Exactly. These yeah. are our protected things, and this is what <laughs> makes us unique. And so looking into uh, making those ordinances have a little bit more teeth and having a little bit more um, requirements behind them, maybe, to protect the things that we think. Those are some opportunities, I think, to really look at watersheds and conservation. Yeah, I, I would suspect that a fair amount of time on the planning board is taken up by that. We, we want you to protect this. This is, give. A, there are several ways you could do it. Let's, why, why don't you choose one? Um, and the response is, we don't want to. Right. And our response is, well, then come back to us when you have. <laughs> um, and, but we don't have a lot of teeth. Right, it's right. A, just simply a case of wearing them down. Right. Even in my short time here, you know, going out on site, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna need you to put a fence here and then a placard here. And it should be, we shouldn't have to do that. We should just have some very specific requirements. I think in that we we mean what we say, we want, then let's let's do that. Anna? Yes. I've um, been interested and in, have been listening to the discussion. And I've still had a question in the back of my mind, which I think was answered. Um, healthy discussion, very nice review. My question was, to what end? You know, why are we doing this right now? I mean, it's always good to discuss it. But uh, what you just said, having to do with looking toward actual ordinance revisions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yes, the, so the comp plan, and communities and cities that have comprehensive plans, it's their guiding sort of document, if you will. And some, some communities do a really good job of using them, some just put them on the shelf and it's just a nice book. Well, I mean, but the long-range planning committee specifically. The long-range planning your committee hopes are for is what a, this review is about. To get us to what ordinances we want to change in what order. Because um, that's sort of the task, I think, that my charge is, is to get you to a point of action. So that's, want to have this discussion and then 
these first <coughs> steps, um, there's some groupings of some things. And if you looked ahead in the PowerPoint, you'll see that I've sort of grouped some, some ideas. And so I'm looking for some input from this group to say, okay, staff, go work on these groups, rally the forces, see what you have, and then we'll start talking about these, these topics first. That's what I'm really looking for. Whether we change ordinance or not. Correct. Confirm. Yeah. Yes. And there's a follow, you know, there's a process for that. So just like we did uh, the site plan review for this, then it went to the ordinance committee. So that's how we'll go through it. Sure. And so task six was to guide future development growth to grow areas, not conservation areas, while also providing facilities and infrastructure. Uh, and so this is just an opportunity to the, the map on the left side is a trails and parks map from another community I just grabbed, but it's a great look at the dotted lines or the connections and the solid are existing. And so with our transportation master plan, I think this is something we're really looking into making sure we have this, the trails and all the different opportunities, because this is a tool that we would use in planning, uh, a really great tool. When someone comes in and wants to develop something, I have this, oh, I need this connection here. And so this is what we're looking, we'd be looking for you um, developers to provide. And so we can get this done. We don't have this, we have this in bits and pieces now, but the transportation master plan, and then I think part of community services uh, master plan, once that gets wrapped up, we'll start to have this really in place and we can fill in those gaps. I so think it's ability too. I yes, think yes. Yes, so there's a lot of different pieces, but it'll be great to have this uh, just a wonderful working tool. So. Yeah, oh, Adam, I just want to throw out there uh, <laughs> this is Jean Marie's sitting here, my mind going off while you're talking. Electric bikes mm -hmm. are getting really big. Yes. I see more and more of them. In fact, I see some of them riding right in the middle of traffic. It scares <laughs> the hell out of me, but. Um, and I'm just throwing this out there. I'd like to see us make sure as we're developing, you know, our plans that we are taking into consideration bikes, you know, whatever they may be. Um, and that, and particularly on my side of the turnpike, because you take your life in your hands. Sure. If you're on a bike or walking, I take my life in my hands to walk to the neighborhood and back for me to walk. But I, just to keep that in front of us as we go along um, for future. Okay, yeah, that's a great And I hear that from my neighbors too, all the time, so. Yeah, and, and what we may find is that our trail systems and what we provide west of the turnpike look a little different and are designed a little different than what's in the actual part of the town or right. whatever, you know? And so that's, having those different standards in place is definitely right. a viable option. So task six, um, again, maintain, review the existing RF zoning, review in the GMO. You see in a lot of like similarities, right? A lot of these tasks are really sort of really similar um, items. Encourage density and growth areas, buffer standards, uh, transportation plan linkages, making sure that all the places that people want to go are identified and they can get there. And there's alternatives to automobile traffic. Get people there, I know. Um, that's a huge thing. Incorporating everything together. So you just uh, have this. I envision this beautiful map of everything that's cool about Scarborough, right? And these are the pieces. And here's how you can get there. And there's the missing piece. And that's what we want as a vision. And I think that's what we're really working towards. All the different groups are, are getting to that point. Um, it's going to be. It's going to be a big map, right? It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be very big. Um, Eric printed me a map the other day. I'm like, no, it's not big enough. <laughs> we need to be able to draw. Um, community services, again, their parks plan ties into that. Conservation requirements and then those activity centers, you know, identifying where those are and those linkages. I think that's huge. Is it possible, not just from a GMO perspective, but <clears throat> like, say, west of the Turnpike, there's a lot of um, affected watershed areas of the mm -hmm. Turnpike, um, but uh, any East Turnpike for that matter. Um, in residential zones, is it possible for us to charge extra for development permit um, when it hits a, when that is in a watershed area or not a wetlands area per se, but it's in a watershed that we are seeking to protect or that we see under stress or something like that? 
can we just say, okay, you want to build a house here, you're a family, you found your developer, you've got your two and a half acres, you're within your setbacks, but here's an extra $2,000 we're going to make you spend to, I'm throwing the number out here, right, That's, uh, um, but, uh, because you're, you're in the red books. Almost like a watershed impact for you. Exactly. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer. I don't know. Okay, just kind of curious. That's a good question. <clears throat> that, and I know you're going to get pushback from not just developers, but real estate, real yeah, estate yeah, community, think. and and people like myself who happen to be in the real estate community, but also really pushing for affordable housing. Yeah. There's more fees you add on, the more expensive you're making housing too. So you got way, you got to have a balance there. No, you're right. And, and like you said, it's, it's just, uh, I don't think we normally think of impact fees for single family housing or, resi or, or residential yeah. housing. Usually impact fees are normally for commercial or, or scale multifamily development. Well, we have school impact fees. Yeah. yeah. And, and, so for any, but for, yeah. And that's what I'm thinking. It's like, can we have impact fees for conservation? For, for for folks who would not necessarily have the scale of a property that would we'd say okay we need to put a trail through this area right. or things like that but can we say this area will eventually need a trail and we'll need buffer zones so pay an extra fee just I'm, I'm, I'm and part no, of the is can we um, but uh, there will be the, the process of robust engagement from our partners in the real estate development community um, but uh and your council <laughs> but i'm just just throwing that definitely, definitely. nicely phrased <laughs> part of when you say incorporating everything together uh as a as, a, as i heard it is a vision for uh this committee uh you're 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 envisioning long-range planning as the committee is taking the 35,000 foot view and seeing how and everything that, that, that's an enormous task. And can't, I mean, it, it almost by definition prevents us from going into specifics as you were just what? outlining, as opposed to seeing various committees and what they're doing. Well, you all. Uh, tasked all the other committees with parts of the comp plan, right? And so these are the things that are left to this committee. Um, and so, yes, I think that you all are sort of the umbrella committee and you have to be aware of that, but you also have the job to dive into the specifics too, like the others. So, well, specifically though, the, uh, I, the, the vision of incorporating everything together. Mm -hmm. Is that your job? Is I, that I think so. I think that is sort of my job and over, sort of as the overseer of this comp plan. I mean, I'm the town planner. And this is my, my, my book, if you will, that I'm charged with sort of making happen. <coughs> and so I'm going to make you guys do a lot of work, Marvin. <laughs> a lot of work to do to get there. Uh, but all of the committees, you know, sustainability, conservation, community services, um, transportation, they all have a lot of work to do. And I think it's the guiding principle behind it, you know, in front of it, if you will. So, and maybe this is probably the last of these very high level conversations that I'll have with you all, and then they'll start to get really specific. Um, and I, Am I, am I, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm concerning you for the workload or not being clear in what. It's more than doing. clarity. I'm not, I, I can't identify the workload. We're, okay. at, we're at a very That's high. Well, let me, yeah. yeah, let me get through this and then uh, I think we'll get there. Right. I, 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 my only question, and I don't mean to stall this operation, uh, is do you seek committee guidance in the uh, goal of incorporating everything together? Or is that something that you will advise us on? I think it will be both sides. And then we'll ultimately, each of these pieces will have to go through the ordinance committee and the town council. Like we are not approving or um, we're, we're recommending yeah. uh, 
Uh, and so I'm a facilitator. So I see my, I'm a facilitator for this committee to get us to these points and then recommending. And if they change along the way, or we'll back up and do that as well. But that's how I see it. Right. Appreciate it. Thanks. And it's fluid. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's very fluid. And, and these these tasks are very high level, and that's why I wanted to take this opportunity to break them down into pieces that I think, because you could get really, we could talk about guiding future development to growth areas for years. Like, what does that mean? And so just trying to, okay, does it mean this to everybody? Can we all get behind this? Can we, can we focus on that? Is what I'm really trying to do for you all. So this is in summary, um, all of the different things that I mentioned, there's commercial design standards, residential design standards, landscaping design standards, the italics are things that are already sort of occurring, reviewing the existing GMO, uh, use standards, housing options, setbacks, parking, project amenity requirements. So really looking at what um, is required for different types of development for amenity standards and making those trails and uh, community pools, those sort of things, requirements. There's certain thresholds, affordable housing incentives, density incentives, impact fees. We're undertaking that transportation master plan. We're undertaking that as well. Uh, transit opportunities, complete streets requirements, maintaining, reviewing the existing RF zoning, rural design standards, performance standards, performance standards, conservation requirements, and other. So it's a lengthy list of things that we really to achieve these goals in this comp plan that need to occur. So, so it's pretty daunting, but this is- um, And also just to supplement that, the last time we did this, it took us six or eight years to get through yeah. all the items, mm -hmm. you know, speaking of the history. So it's, I mean, it's daunting, but it's also, it's why we have to prioritize which I we're going to tackle right. first. So definitely a long-term commitment for yeah. the long range of it. So, I have a private question on, uh -huh. on the, but we've moved oh, on to potential. Sure. Is it worth, obviously not now as we're taking this uh, high level view, but when you say prioritizing, it's sort of this list. That and, is and even this, further, right. Yes. That yeah, we want to go one, two, three, four, five. Yes. Okay. If, and if we can find an efficient way to tackle more than one at a time, which I think Autumn's trying to do here, I think, yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah. So this is just my intent of sort of grouping some things together that make sense um, and to look at these. And so, you know, commercial design standards, landscaping, parking, commercial uses, setback and bulk standards. So these all sort of tie into your non-residential uses. They achieve a lot of different pieces. One way we would, you know, if you all said, let's go with this, this task list first, we would look at our existing uh, design standards, we would do some visual preference sort of surveys to get on the same page, and then we do some sample ordinance, you know, what it looks like to make these things requirements, where we could have some allowances for give and take situations. So um, each of these buckets, if you will, probably think about like a year. Um, one thing that struck me when, when we looked at these groupings, I think these are great groupings, is that they really kind of fall into the commercial rural um, RF, R2, R2 zone. Yeah. Um, what I'd say is the commercial one, as we think about mixed use, probably needs um, some of the residential things to fall mm -hmm. under that, just with the notion of it being more multifamily focused or, or mixed use focused. But, um, you know, I want to make sure we're not losing sight of that on the commercial one. Sure, um, we can definitely incorporate. And yeah, this again yeah. is just some ideas. So yeah, no, because again, I think it maps well as we think about ordinance um, uh, changes. The ordinances that probably that will get most impacted are the commercial zoning ordinances mm -hmm. um, and the, the the sort of target growth zone ordinances and things like that, um, which right now largely preclude residential right. uh, uh, right. development, and we'll probably want to look at removing some of that exclusion, <clears throat> but doing so in a way that, <clears throat> that is respectful of design standards, et cetera, et cetera. So, That's a great um, point. Um, the, the, the other two I think are, are great. I like how you move them. I think they're, 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 they're good. Um, probably all three also need um, conservation requirement because again, I think that's fallen through 
across all of our discussions on the six tasks. There's a conservation element or environmental mm -hmm. protection. But I like these. I like how you group these. And like I said, they fall neatly into okay. A task force can work on the resident on the R, um, RF and RFN zones. A task force can work on the R two and associated zones, and a task force can work on the commercial and private uh, development zones. And that gets to Marvin. Some of your question: Where would we go with this? It's we're going to be changing. We're adapting zoning ordinances and some of the, the, the other. Development related ordinances, and that's how you think about what to do. Does this help, Marvin? Kind of understanding sort of where we're going. Uh, yes. It's the simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. On, on, on the truth of the matter, it's from my point of view at least, is the relationship, individual relationship of, of one town planner. Idea to another town planner's idea and approach, and I'd be, you know, fooling myself, fooling you, and almost I to say I understand your vision. I'm just getting to know your vision. Sure, sure. Any any specifics as opposed to broad generalities are welcome as far as I'm concerned. I think that's my approach is always very, I try to give you all the options and really help you understand where they are. If there's a question or you don't, if I say a word, like, what is that? What would that look like? I'll bring it if there's another idea that I'm missing. Um, I try to always, be, like I said, I, as a planner, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have an interest in the game, if you will, other than to help the town achieve its goals. And so those goals can change, they can exclude it. I may not agree with them, I may love them. Um, I'm just really here as a facilitator <clears throat> to get you to this, this long range planning um, and public outreach. This is what I love about planning. I've done a lot of this in some large communities and, and comprehensive plans. It's kind of my specialty development review, the day to day stuff, that's good. But this is really exciting stuff. And I think it's where you can really, you can really set the stage for a community to grow, to not grow, to be beautiful, to be ugly, to be, you know, tall or short. I mean, you can really, really set the stage for what you want it to look like. So it's always, I always see it as a, as a great challenge and opportunity to say, okay, this is what you say you want. Let me help you get there. If you, if you don't want what you said you want, let me know. And other things need to occur, but and coming in at the end of this conference too is fantastic timing uh, for me because you said what you have what you want, right? And so now we're just trying to to get there to make it happen. Um, so that's that's sort of you know we've visited a few times. That's sort of I think you'll find that's just kind of who I am and who I just really want to help this this group, the other groups, and, and the town achieve their goals. You know, if there's a method or if I go too fast with something or you don't like something, just let me know and I can find a different way. I'm very direct, very, you know, kind of honest and just upfront about things. You'll find that kind around. Of honest. You what? Kind of honest. Kind of honest. Okay, that's good to know. I will, I'll, I will sugarcoat some things if they sound too harsh, maybe. Um, but yeah, so I think, I think if you want me to approach this group differently, I think it was fortuitous that the transition happened what it did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jay did great with us, did a fabulous job focusing us towards the comprehensive plan. Um, in hindsight, now seeing how broad our points were and you know the, the issues we're going to have to get into, we couldn't we couldn't have foreseen, foreseen that back at the beginning of this. Um, so now we've got to dig into the meat of it, and I think you know it's, it's, it sounds like you're the right person to focus us. So looking forward to you know, getting into this and honing in on some more of the specifics rather than these twenty thousand foot. Yeah, yeah, and, and your comp plan looks like most of the comp plans I'm used to, so it's it's pretty standard stuff. I think it's a little different for Maine. Mains are yeah. usually more implementation, yeah. but the way yours looks is actually looks like what I'm used to. So, yeah. yeah.
this is kind of standard process for uh, some other communities I've been in, but it's okay. But candidly, it's good to have your outside eyes take a look at our comp plan and then take a look at where we are in the zoning and say, listen, we're we're not making a major remapping mm -hmm. of the town or but you probably, as you dig into the, what you have mapped, there's a lot of implementation underneath the hood right. county. So it's different than what happened 10 or 12 years ago. Yep. Yeah. Um, but it's, um, and, and we, we, we applied the right paint. Now we have to go into the house. <laughs> I'll stop. Second, what my colleague, uh, the chair, said um, it's, it's extremely fortuitous, and I think the timing is right to, for you to come here, and also so that. You know, our chair of the planning board feels fully supported, and that um, it's just the time is right. And we're just so, I'm just so glad you're here. Nice. <laughs> so, with that, um, tell me what you think about where to go from here. What you want to start working on, uh, diving into? You want to break the ice? <laughs> There is a an image from Alice in Wonderland <laughs> when Alice is standing in a tree looking up at the Cheshire Cat. <laughs> and Cheshire Cat says, uh, so where do you want to go? She said, I don't know. I said, well, you know, <laughs> anyway, anyway, we'll go. Any, anyway, anyway we'll you go, go, you're going to get there. <laughs> um, so this is our Cheshire Cat moment. So I'm not shy and so i think uh performance standards are are really 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 important um especially as it pertains to um differentiating in in, in certain areas um I'll, I'll just stop there i think performance standards are really important I'm looking at Rachel. Rachel uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at the residential design standards and thinking about the amount of work that's in back of that because we have um, we have different standards for our different neighborhoods. So that's actually a pretty big chunk to take a look at. If we want to take a look at that, then we end up reviewing Higgins Beach. We end up reviewing um anything along Route one uh we end up reviewing dunston corners design standards we review the downs and so if that's where we want to go understand that that's going to take us a really yeah, long time is there one, one of the things that an organizer understands is that it's very helpful to have early success early victories yeah. So in a sense, my recommendation is take something that we something smaller that we can accomplish, you leave that feeling good and ready to, to go on. So rather than take something that's kind of massive, which would be residential design. So parking standards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> parking, parking standards. Those are easy. I have a few suggestions. Uh, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm just saying it is we start to look at this. We need to kind of think about the the mass of it, and I would recommend something that will give us practice working on it and move us forward and with a with a victory that we can go forward with. I might suggest to actually review, maintain, or review existing RF zone. That's come up in a number of different forums that I'm part of, um, zoning being our zoning board being one of them, um, and it does seem like that is right for review, but it's also a, a focused and kind of a, a telescope sort of a, or microscope sort of approach. So that would be, oh, I, I throw that one to the mix. So you're going to pick on me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, like, I like Rachel's strategy of uh, set ourselves up for success and Portia's suggestion of, of choosing something small like parking standards. Um, I'd also encourage us as we're working through that to sort of prioritize these based on the timeliness and what's happening in town. Um, and getting back to Marvin's point of what, what are other, com, com, you know, sort of committees doing that help us to sort of sift things through to see what is coming out. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I like the idea of sort of 
prioritizing all of them, not, not meaning do them all right now, but just say, maybe for our homework, what's, what's most important and you know, what's the strategy for addressing these so that we can be accountable to the public and to council and let them know this, this is how we're moving forward. I guess I would, I would add that we also really just kind of went through the residential design standards in the last round. So those are kind of recent, but yeah. I would just offer that the one thing that was not decided in residential design standards is what is the definition of New England vernacular? <laughs> which New England and which century? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Be that easy win. Yeah, so no, that 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 would not yeah. be. I, I think that would not be an easy win. Although it's something that we're wrestling with. Yeah, and, and consistently wrestled with. Yeah. Um, so well, you know it when you don't see it. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but a lot of it is. Yeah, we know it when we see it, or we don't see it, and and sometimes um, when we get something like what I euphemistically call the Halloween house on uh, Oak Hill. You know, does it meet the design standards? Yes. Is it meeting new design standards? Yes. Uh, did we have to put it through? Yes. Did we want to hide it? Okay. Um, because I didn't think it. I didn't think it met. Um, so it, it's that one is awfully um, flexible and fuzzy. Okay. I don't see us getting a fast win. You made your point. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> you will recall this. The last time we went through this drill for the last conflict, mm -hmm. the current, um, the task was a bit more daunting because there, there were a lot of changes to the ordinance that the prior plan said ought to be addressed. I didn't get the sense this time around that we had that level of right. what change. The process we went through then was we essentially tried to identify ordinance provisions that were inconsistent with vision mm -hmm. and then worked on changes. The one that obvious one that comes to mind is, is uh, the downs. Mm -hmm. We developed a whole new uh, zone for that. Uh, but in a lot of cases, we would tackle commercial design standards, for example look at what you would have said now and we would say is that does that match up well with what we suggested we ought to what the vision in the plan is and um yes everybody's happy check on the next item it's the low-hanging fruit sort of concept that mm -hmm. so i i don't i'm not sure i can tell you now what i think we ought to look at first but i think that as an approach is probably the way to go yes yeah, it tags on to what Rachel said about you know, getting her own victory here. So to speak. I, I, I think I followed what you just said, and I agree with it. Uh, as a comment, it sounded to me as so though you were providing a guideline by which you approach an approach. Very good. Uh, my two cents is uh, it, it, in World Series vernacular, I'm above strength base hits to get you. You want to score some runs, right? You gotta get some hits. And you gotta get some hits. I also like going for the fence. Um, and commercial design standards. For the last couple of years, almost I've been involved here, I think in terms of a lot of attention being on residential. Uh, and I, I like the idea of commercial design standards because I think it's the future. And I don't think we've touched upon it very much. And that, that's just a very broad general terms. I might be wrong. Uh, so I would, aiming for the fences, I would go for uh, commercial design standards. That's still what it says, yeah. That's my, <clears throat> my preference is to start with commercial design standards because I think Rachel's has to deal with a lot. Yeah, I, I, my my question is when when we talk about 
commercial. Um, an apartment is considered commercial, apartment building. So are we talking about designs of apartments or other businesses or mixed use? Because what's going to almost immediately come before the planning board from the downs will be mixed use, um, commercial, first floor, residential on up. So I, we simply need, if that's where we're going to go, we need a definition of what we're looking at. I, I think you just I, asked the next question. <clears throat> Yeah. So I have a question on that. All of the above, yeah. basically, just for clarification. So I understand that apartment buildings are considered commercial for assessing purposes, but is that also true for planning purposes? Um, that's not terribly. It's clear. not really clear, right? So, <laughs> and and that, so we, we but we know it when we see it. Don, we couldn't hear you down here, but. Um, the point I was making is that apartment buildings, five units or more, are considered commercial from the standpoint of assessment. Okay, they're they're not considered residential. My question was, is that also true for planning? And the answer was not clear. Right. So anyway, I just I know in real estate, uh, four units or more are considered commercial. But, and I think to all of your points, so commercial design standards may say commercial design standards, truly commercial is this is their bucket, mixed use is this bucket, because mixed use is a very different animal, it's lower setbacks, higher whatnot, and multifamily could have its own sort of, and they can all borrow from each other, but there's, they're distinct, and those distinctions aren't made now. So that if we were to tackle it, I think that would be part of that process to make those distinctions. So they don't all look the same, but not uh, not addressing the single family with them, but multifamily, mixed use, and commercial. That could be part of that. And I think if we want to encourage mixed use, which is you know the first task we had laid out, then um, that aligns well with Rachel your issues on the planning board, which is that's what you're going to be facing relatively. So, and I think we want to encourage commercial, period. I mean, that's part of diversify the tax base and then define what, and, you know, pick yeah, all of the above, basically. The, the, um, they're, it's actually, they're actually called design standards for Scarborough's commercial districts. Um, Sue Augustus, late Sue Augustus, was behind a lot of the stuff. Some of you may know. And I wonder whether for the next meeting we ought to all read the commercial the design standards so that we can be prepared at the next meeting to talk about whether they need to be tweaked or modified or what have yeah, deficiencies are. What, what are they called, Rick? It's, it's, it's section um, 405 e dash one of the uh, building land use development uh, section of the I can send them to you yeah, all too. Yeah. It's, it's right it's here the in the ordinance. Sure and, part of the uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, town ordinances, chapter <laughs> chapter four. <laughs> and Rick, to your point, I think that's a great way for us if if you all decide that might be the first thing to look at. We, I can sort of highlight the deficiencies and, oh, yeah. this matches, this is good, or, oh, this is not clear, let's work on this. And Maybe in that framework, does it meet our comp language? That's a great way to look at it. The other part of that, Rick, that I'd like is you know, the title is for Scarborough's commercial district. Right. So it's understanding which districts these apply to and where there's potentially inconsistencies in the district zoning ordinance. Well, it may be that the language needs to change. Yeah, okay. Because commercial districts is probably not the best way. That, that's kind of my best. I mean, if, if nothing else, maybe we define what types of structures they apply to. Maybe we leave them as is and just say, these apply to X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And that would be clear. On the other hand, it does capture multi-family mixed use. I mean, it does, if it's in a commercial district, then it captures, even though there are different types of buildings, it captures. Arguments to be made for how it's defined. But I think understanding which districts it currently apply to is yes. mm -hmm. a good starting point. Yeah. There are only 78 pages. 
<laughs> small print. There's a lot of pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a it's a document we don't have other than a PDF. Of. Yeah, so we, we don't even have the ability to edit. The document. Yeah, we it's can't search it. Older. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's a scan. It's a Did scan. Oh, boy. Give you, it's not so it's time for us to update them anyway, so we Whoa. can <laughs> update them. To give you guys an idea, I mean, I grew up in the town where a lot of those pictures were taken, and there was a movie gallery that was included in one of the pictures, and there's no movie galleries or movie <laughs> stores anymore, so they've been around for quite some time. O OCR, right? <laughs> so it sounds like commercial design standards, and we'll, we'll define it further as we move along, but next time, for next time, you all will... That'll be your Thanksgiving dinner reading <laughs> 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 conversations around the turkey. I know we can start there. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. 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 Great. Great. So now we're going to turn it over. I'm so excited we got through that. That was a great discussion. Yeah. Now we're going to turn it over. We have a zoning ordinance amendment concerning fleet department and outdoor storage. And I asked Brian Longstaff to join us as our phone enforcement officer. And this is an issue um, that he is taking quite off. Is it okay? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, is everybody happy with where we, in terms of moving forward with commercial design standards? I don't see any. Yeah, yeah. let's move on to the next item. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I will add just on the topic, the last topic you're talking about in the zoning ordinance, it says at the end of the, at the end of the purpose of each zone, whether it's a commercial district to be considered commercial or a residential district. So when you're looking at those commercial design standards, that tells you which districts they would apply to. So good to offer that up. Um, yeah, so something we've been dealing with um, uh, for some time. Uh, Karen Martin and, and I and Jay before Autumn and now Autumn um, have sort of been involved in this. And, and, and that's this conundrum of how we, we define outdoor storage. So we prohibit outdoor storage in many of our business districts. Um, in certain other business districts, outdoor storage is a special exception. So you have to go to the planning request zoning board to get approval as a special exception for outdoor storage. Outdoor storage is defined as the keeping of uh, any uh, in any unroofed area, any goods, materials, merchandise, or vehicles in the same place for more than 24 hours. So if you just drive up and down Route 1, see many permitted use commercial businesses who have the need for what I call fleet use. They have service vehicles that need to go out and provide their service to their business or deliver their goods. And, and many times those vehicles would end up being parked over the weekend for more than 24 hours. And we've actually had some situations where we've had to take enforcement action, which seems completely counterintuitive to, you know, we've permitted the business, but you can't have the vehicles. So we were trying to wrestle with this, this nut and see if, if we could figure out a way to make it reasonable. I totally understand the, the thought behind outdoor storage, including certain things in that. I don't really understand so much why vehicles were included. I can certainly see if you had a, a line of 20 vehicles with your business logo and name on it, it sort of becomes this advertising mass. Uh, I get that. So. We're, we're, we're certainly sensitive to that, and I thought I would, uh, this would be a great forum to, to put your great minds to work and see what you thought might be reasonable. Again, performance standards, I heard someone mention that. Performance standards are a great way to allow something, but allow it in a way that's pleasing or appropriate in your Are there complaints? Have there been actual issues or... <laughs> There have been one or two, oddly enough, not a, not a, a bunch of complaints. The problem is we're, I'm, I'm charged, I'm not code enforcement enforcer, I'm the zoning administrator. <laughs> and I'm charged with enforcing a zoning ordinance, which half of which I don't even like, but I have to enforce it. And, and so this is one of those situations where when we're reviewing a permitted use 
we have to ask that question. What, what do you have for us in storage? And, um, there was a situation um, on Route 1 a few years back that, that did get particularly contentious um, because of that, that melodic or storage of vehicles being a part of that. There's currently a situation on Route 1 um, down at the corner of Queens Drive that is very contentious um, and it involves the parking and, and storage well, so as well as other things so um, I, I just thought you know, I drafted up some, just to try to spur the conversation on it gets thought I, I you've got a document there that has read underlying text of how you know this is just one pass at it um, changing the definition of outdoor storage um, to allow fleet vehicles if they uh, if they uh, apply with the performance standards and then go to the performance standards and tweak those and and so I just thought uh, I'd like to get your your thoughts on how we might uh, have a chance to look at this how you know, is this is this getting anywhere near something that we should fine tune or do we need to go in a totally different direction or should we leave it alone um, are you opposed to having service vehicles? These are registered, inspected, on the road vehicles for the purpose uh, which they were put, not, not storing junk cars and you know old refrigerators and those kinds of things. We're just simply talking about vehicles and really Yeah, out of curiosity, how does a car dealership deal with this? Yeah, I was just thinking yeah. that too. <laughs> car dealerships in Scarborough are all in contract zones. Oh, true. So we have special special allowances in the contract zones. You can't put every business in a contract zone. So and there are zones that do allow for vehicle storage. If you're in the industrial zone, yeah. outdoor storage is not an issue. But nobody want you know these businesses up and down want yeah. want that exposure. They don't want to be out on pleasant yeah, right. sign advertising for them too. You know it, it is it's, it's definitely yeah. Yeah. you and that's why I thought the performance standards would would sort of sort of try to get them to the back of the lot, perhaps behind the building or to the side of the building, and not great that on Route One. But that leads to another question: What do you do with existing sites that don't have that capability? Right. You have a tenant space that somebody could perfectly fit into, but they have these fleet vehicles, and the parking, unfortunately, is all along Route One. So what do you do there? And, and, and that you know, that's more of a question. I don't have a good, good answer for that. But that's the. That's the issue that we wanted to put out there. We, we really wanted to try to do it in a thoughtful way, um, looking at both existing sites and new sites. It's certainly easy to for the planning board to look at that as another component of all the things that you're already looking at. And where is that storage going to occur? And how many vehicles? And can we condition our approval on the number of those vehicles and the fact that they're to be parked in this designated area? And that kind of existing sites pose a little bit more of a, a challenge. Yeah, um, <clears throat> this would be very helpful to the planning board. Um, one of the things that we sometimes get is a very small business uh, where either the owner has to take his, the vehicle home at night or has to build uh, a garage. So it's so it's hidden. And we had that on a group one case, just a small business in HVAC. Um, and the, the the owner designed the um, the building so that the vehicle could be pulled in. Now, if there's going to be another vehicle, if the owner is going to end up expanding, which is certainly his hope, um, then what? Is he going to have to have staff take the vehicles home on the weekend or always have, you know, in their presence? I, and then we had the other case, um, where yes, the, the group one in Queens, uh, which was very contentious because we never got a firm count, but there were probably 20 vehicles uh, lined up on both sides of the road across the street um, and no real way to, to buffer in that case. We had very little authority other than saying, well, there's no parking here, no parking here, no parking here. So, you know, otherwise you're, you gotta, you gotta move all of this. And, and we were putting the owner in a very difficult position. Meanwhile, the neighbors were sending us lots of letters. <laughs> uh, so I think this is helpful. It gives us some guidance. I'm, 
I'm not clear how we it would be or would it be retroactive. Yeah. Uh, that I think needs to be considered or people grandfathered in, which would not then solve the problem until that business is sold. Yeah. Uh, but for instance, the, the comfort keepers up on your yeah. one. Um, do those folks take their vehicles home? Uh, do they leave them there in the weekend? Uh, it's not unsightly. There are other places where it would be unsightly. Um, it, it gives us some some help as people come before us. It doesn't doesn't handle you know business is already in place necessarily. But I, I think this is a, a good step forward. And landscaping might be a piece of it too. Again, retroactively, right. right. businesses that come to us now, right? We require a buffer. But even and and, and 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 whatever uh, trucks there are to be hidden in the thing, but to be screened. I'll say, I, I, taking a look at the language here, I didn't think of it. In, even in my neighborhood, there are um, small business people in the HVAC world or the electric electrical world um, who I think would be better served by the language that's up on the screen right now, which has carved out for more than X. Um, or so, in other words, if you, that the person with the one truck or the two or three trucks, small business, they're not expanding rapidly. Um, I, I think well, um, they should be they shouldn't be held to the same standard of putting all the vehicles to the, to the rear and the side as you would if you had you know a, a fleet of fifteen um, trucks or, or the like. Um, and uh, um, and and right now, um, considering the sightliness, in many cases, those proprietors or their employees. Bring their trucks or their vans home with them and park them in the in, in the driveway. And um, now that's not great for the residential neighborhood to have a, a each pack repair truck um, over um, uh, hanging out in the driveway over the weekend. So um, I kind of like that idea of having more than I, I I'd say of uh, any more than four. So up to four vehicles is doesn't have to be in the back, but. Um, for uh, four or less, if they've got a space that they're using for a storefront, they could put them in the in the front in the, in the regular parking um, uh, spaces. Um, so that would be my, my proposal on that one. But I like this language a little bit better than the the blanket language that was uh, in that one. I want to go to Robin, but also be aware that we're at twenty five. So we need to wrap this up and finish the last couple of items. So. I was just wondering if there would be uh, for existing development, if there could be a clause in there for like a certain time limit for them to comply with and oh. see if there's like an in lieu fee or something that they could tap into um, to have to put those measures in place, whatever they be landscaping, barriers, off site parking, those types of things to help them move toward this in six months, six years, whatever we want the. Um, the sundown period to be on this so that we are following this on all open oh, business in Saco for off site parking for weekend right. the shuttle go. service. <laughs> I so I think we like have some things, things to digest here and then we're not going to wrap this up. <laughs> no. Brian, thank you for giving us an introduction. I, we might have you back. I have a feeling to <laughs> clarify some issues here, but I think over the next the next month, uh, this on next month's agenda, yes. we should probably get a better conclusion. Yes, thank you. Um, staff updates. Uh, yeah, can we wrap it? So we'll wrap that one up. Staff updates. Uh, our next meeting will be December 2nd, and the Ordinance Committee uh, took action on the site plan revisions, and it's going to Council next Wednesday. The changes we suggested for the site plan requirements for uh, unified ownership. Still, the Ordinance Committee is still discussing the two rod uh, road. That one will be back. For the next that one's going to be back. That's good. Yes, sir.
Thank you all. You have a great weekend. Well, yeah, it's you and me.